All right, so we talked previously about acute kidney injury and about, um, you know, kind of when things are happening suddenly or rapidly. We also talked about in that last phase, that recovery phase, sometimes some patients don't recover and they progress to chronic kidney disease. And also some patients just develop chronic kidney disease. Um, so let's look at some head to toe changes and really what this patient looks like. What are we going to assess for? So when things get chronic, they get, they usually progress. Like usually chronic kidney disease doesn't, you don't just wake up with chronic kidney disease. It progresses. And usually you have multiple assaults or issues with your kidneys before it gets uh, chronic. And when it gets chronic, it's irreversible loss of the kidney function. And it ends with what we call ESRD, which is end-stage renal disease. And that's when, when we say end-stage renal disease, that means I need dialysis. My kidneys are completely not functioning. I cannot get rid of, uh, rid of my waste or fluids. I need help. I need a machine to do it for me. Um, the leading causes of this are going to be diabetes and hypertension. And a lot of people get confused by this. They're like, I thought you said that, um, you know, a lot of the problems uh, with the kidneys that hurt the kidneys is not enough pressure isn't hypertension a lot of pressure? And here's the thing most people don't understand is hypertension is a constriction or a narrowing. Even though there's a lot of pressure, it doesn't mean there's a lot of fluid. So hypertension, there's actually a lot of times that hypertension decreases blood flow to the kidneys because um, they get so constricted and narrow with the extra pressure. And so um, it actually decreases the flow to the kidneys. So with everything good in life, there's always stages. And so with chronic kidney disease, there are five stages. Um, and so, uh, you know, the most important thing that I usually see um, focused on is understanding that stage five, understanding in stage renal, where do we get to where we need dialysis? And that's when our GFR is less than 15. All right, now let me back up a second. What am I talking about GFR? Uh, we call it, um, it's something that I will uh, be bringing up in other, either, I, it's either late, I wanna say it's later this PowerPoint or it might be in another one, um, but effectively GFR is what we call glomerular filtration rate. And this is telling me how well am I filtering things? Cause that's my main function of my kidneys. Um, and when I get to the point where I am not filtering things well at all, I am less than 15. That is at the point where, you know, my kidneys uh, like I need help. I need a machine to do the job for my kidneys. Um, so that's what we call stage five, but you can kind of see how it progresses. You know, it starts on here on stage one where there's damage to the kidney and it can actually have normal or increased glomerular filtration rate. So I'm filtering okay, um, but I wanna reduce risk factors. So kind of think of this like when a patient starts to, um, you know, when cardiovascular disease, which I know you guys love to talk about, it's kind of like when you're starting to build up plaques in your blood, like, you know, maybe there's no problems yet, um, but you know, there's starting to be some, there's gonna be some issues in the future if you don't reduce the risk factors. So I wanna to try to reduce any risk factors or any damage to my kidneys. When I get to stage two, um, I'm gonna be starting to kind of see that there's a decrease in a little bit of decrease in function um, and I really want to be watching out for complications that might be coming up because again, I'm, I'm really trying to stop their risk here. And then as we go down, um, they, they need more and more aggressive treatment. And by the time we get to stage four, I need to be preparing because if a patient gets to the point where they need dialysis, this is not something that I can just wake up one day and be like, oh, patient needs dialysis state. Like they have to have a special access to get dialysis. And there's a lot of other planning and preparation. And so if they're getting to the point where their kidney, um, their glomerular filtration rate gets pretty low. Um, I'm going to start preparing them for this and see if this is an option they're looking into. So the kidney disease affects the whole body and look at all these different ways it affects the body. So I've broken down these slides into each body system and how, um, especially chronic kidney disease, how you're going to see it in these patients. So let's start with the top of the body. So um, we talked about this with AKI, um, patients that have kidney issues and when you get to this chronic stage, they are building up waste. And those waste, like, you know, all of those, um, you know, when you think about BUN, the um, blood urea nitrogen, all those waste, like that nitrogen waste, when it builds up, it, cause it causes depression. I'm not talking about sadness depression, but actual depression of your central nervous system um, where it cannot function as well as it should. So some of the symptoms they're gonna have are fatigue, um, decreased ability to concentrate, they can have altered mental status, they can be irritable. They can also end up having peripheral changes like neuropathy, like restless legs and paresthesias. Um, and overall, 
They can have mood changes as well. There's a loss of independence. A lot of these patients end up on, you know, in stage renal on dialysis. They're dependent upon a machine for their life. Um, they're fatigued all the time. Every day changes. Their life revolves around their treatments. They're not the same person. Um, so they can be emotionally labile. They can be withdrawn. They can be very depressed. So um, trying to hit those psychosocial needs as well. There's also cardiovascular changes. The most common cause of death in patients with chronic kidney disease is cardiovascular disease. They can have heart attacks, strokes, heart failure, and cardiovascular disease and um, uh, chronic, uh, chronic kidney disease are closely linked. Like um, hypertension is a cause and a complication of chronic kidney disease. So in other words, it's kind of like what came first, the chicken or the egg. Sometimes the hypertension causes the kidney issues. Sometimes the kidney issues leads to even worse hypertension, which leads to even worse cardiovascular disease. It's all about blood vessels. Think about common causes of chronic kidney disease. Everything's with that blood volume and that blood vessels. And once you start getting things like hypertension on board, plaques, then, then the whole, all the circulation is affected. Blockages start happening. You start having, like we mentioned, heart attacks, strokes. The heart's not able to pump the way that it's supposed to. So these work hand in hand with each other. It's all about the blood vessels. Um, Additionally, you have to think about with kidney disease, they're also going to have electrolyte imbalances. So because of that, it can also affect the electrical system, aka dysrhythmias and death, as you guys always know, um, you know, for uh, patients that are, um, you know, building up all those uh, like things like potassium in their system and things like that. There's also respiratory changes. So these patients can go into a state of acidosis um, and uh, end up, and remember, remember a, a metabolic acidosis. So the lungs can come back and compensate and do that Kuzmal breathing. Think like DKA, but here's another reason patients can go into metabolic acidosis if their kidneys fail. Because when the kidneys fail, they stop making that bicarbonate. And because they're not making that bicarbonate, they go into a state of acidosis. Um, they can also get fluid overload because since the kidneys, if they're not letting go of urine, they have nowhere to go but to back up um, that fluid. And one of the first place it collects is in the lungs. Um, and so legs and lungs is where fluid collects the, um, the quickest. They may have dyspnea. Um, they can have pleural effusions and other uh, lung complications as well. Um, they also have all this waste in their body, the extra waste accumulating. There can be inflammation. So these patients are going to also be at risk for respiratory infections. GI changes um, because they have too much waste. They can get mouth ulcers. They can get odor, really odorous breath, which may seem like not a big complication, but sometimes when you have something in every part of your body is failing, you're like, can I at least have good smell and breath? Come on now. So yeah, um, upper GI system. Um, it can, uh, they can have a lot of uh, difficulty eating, decreased appetite. So there's two reasons. One, they're building up all these wastes in their body and those wastes actually make them nauseous, can make them vomit but also they're also building up all this fluid. They can get like, um, uh, we call it the fluid in their abdomen. It can put pressure on their stomach where they don't even have an appetite. Um, they can get, the waste can cause GI bleeding. Um, medications that they're given can end up causing constipation. In general, their fatigue and the fact that they're not allowed to drink a lot of fluids can lead to constipation. Um, they can have lower GI bleeding, a lot of issues in the abdomen as well. Um, the, you know, the urinary system or reproductive changes, um, they can have, uh, they can go both ways um, with chronic kidney disease. It depends on what phase they're in, um, but they can have little or no urine or they can have polyuria. Like if a patient's diabetic and then also has kidney disease, it kind of just depends on that patient. Majority of the time, they're going to have little or no urine because that's what chronic kidney disease is all about. It's that, hey, I'm not making any more of this. Um, and then um, uh, after receiving dialysis for a while, if these patients are in stage renal, most of them don't make any urine and that might not make sense. But what happens is effectively when they're getting their dialysis treatments, that's them urinating. That's taking everything off. They don't have the ability to do it themselves, but pretty much every time they get a dialysis treatment, that is them peeing, you know, that's, that's like literally there's stuff that comes out of them. That is all of their, um, their fluid and their waste that's coming out, comes out through the dialysis treatment. Uh, there's also psychological changes in anemia, fatigue, which can lead to changes in hormone levels that can be um, have trouble with fertility, and they also can have decreased libido. Um, and then a lot of it, again, is dependent upon what stage um, of chronic kidney disease and whether or not they're receiving dialysis. 
skin changes they can have really dry skin um, it can be really itchy uncomfortable they can end up scratching and they can get a lot of lesions and skin breakdown in their arms remember a lot of patients with kidney disease also have diabetes which means they may not heal um, there's also a buildup in the waste uh, and electrolytes in the body, you know, like I mentioned in another PowerPoint where it's trying to remove them so that itching can get out of control and be very, very uncomfortable for this patient. Um, so we definitely want to watch their skin closely and try to provide them with treatments to help to support that. Uh, musculoskeletal changes. So, um, you know, the, the kidneys are responsible for production of, of phosphorus. Um, and well, they, they help to, I should say, they are a key player in regulating phosphorus calcium balance. Um, and so effectively, and also vitamin D as well. So all this kind of goes together. So when the kidneys aren't working, they're not activating vitamin D. Um, and because they're not activating vitamin D, there's less calcium. And when that changes how the body is able to regulate because the, the kidneys aren't, um, you know, uh, helping with that calcium vitamin D balance, and this leads to more bone breakdown, weaker bones, and a higher chance of fracture. Um, you know, the body pretty much works in a biofeedback loop. Uh, and like, you know, where it's like, hey, this is, um, I know what I need because you tell me what I need. Um, and so when that loop gets interrupted, when chronic kidney disease happens, this whole process gets out of balance and that normal loop that works really well in sync doesn't work. Um, and then the body tries to, of course, come in and help and it just makes things worse. It ends up breaking down more bone um, and then like again, higher chance of fracture in these patients because their calcium, uh, we call them, um, and vitamin D and phosphorus balance is all off. There's also hematological changes. So the, uh, the kidneys are also in charge of making what's called EPO or erythropoietin. And effectively what that is, is think of this as kind of like the cheerleader hormone um, for making red blood cells. So the kidneys themselves don't make red blood cells, but the kidneys secrete a hormone that tells the bone marrow to make more um, red blood cells. So if the kidneys aren't working like they're supposed to, they're not going to secrete that hormone that's saying, hey, make some more blood cells. Come on, bones, make some more. So what ends up the end result is this patient can get anemic really easy. Um, the other factors is these patients are getting frequent blood draws. They have nutritional problems, so they're already not getting, because remember, all blood cells, uh, all red blood cells are made from so many vitamins. So a lot of these patients aren't getting the vitamins and nutrients they need. Um, they also have increased blood breakdown, um, you know, of their blood cells and also irritations of the tissue. So there's a higher chance of bleeding. So these patients are bleeding more or getting like stuck more. They're not making as much. And then they're also not getting stimulated to make as much. So as a whole, there's a lot of anemia for here. There's also um, with the kidney, uh, decreased kidney function, there's impaired platelet aggregation and releasing of platelet factors. So in other words, they're not doing as much with their platelets. They're also at increased risk for bleeding. Um, and then they also have an altered immune response and changes to their white blood cells. So then they're going to have a high risk of infection. So think of kind of like the patient went back in adult when you learned about patients and all their blood cells and how things can be off in blood disorders. Um, they have low amount of red blood cells. They have low amount of platelets and they also have a low amount. They don't have the same immune response. Like, you know, kind of most people's immune response and infection shows up and their body's like, let's fight this. And in kidney disease, it's kind of like, Oh, I'll be there eventually, you know, like it's going to get there, but it's, it's, it's not going to be the same, like, oomph, it's not going to get there. And so it's going to take longer to fight infection. So they're not going to heal as easily. Um, and then also they're not going to have that same defense. So infections are really going to get them down. Um, so we'll have to watch all those uh, risk factors closely. Um, other changes, uh, chronic kidney disease also uh, leads to, you know, inability to excrete your waste. So you end up accumulating that um, blood urea nitrogen, which leads to the nausea, vomiting, fatigue, altered mental status, um, headaches, things like that. Um, you also have impaired glucose metabolism, um, you know, and so you can have hyperglycemia and hyperinsulinemia. So as a whole, this ends up elevating your triglycerides, which increases your risk of having cardiovascular disease and events. And there's also the fluid electrolyte and acid base balance. These patients usually have high potassium, high magnesium, high phosphorus, low calcium, because phosphorus and calcium work opposite. And then they have that metabolic acidosis. So I really need to watch their labs closely. 
Um, so overall, my diagnostic testing that I'm going to do for these patients, now that I've gone through all of that, uh, you know, just the few minor changes that might happen with chronic kidney disease, let's talk about how we're going to test for this. So we're going to do urine testing. We're going to look at a urinalysis. We want to see what should be present or what shouldn't be present. And when the kidneys aren't working, they let go of things that are supposed to stay in. So they let go of proteins, protein, like um, proteins in the urine is one of the best signs of a problem in the kidney because normally when the kidneys are doing their job, they're not letting go of proteins and other things that shouldn't be filtered out. Um, we'll also be looking for breakdown of the actual tissue cell, those casts in the urine as well. Um, we're gonna do a renal ultrasound and a renal biopsy because a lot of times we don't really know what's going on until we do a biopsy of the kidneys themselves to see how that tissue is functioning. We're also gonna need to check our electrolytes closely, get a chemistry to see what their actual function levels are. And then remember cardiovascular and renal close connected. So we need to see how are they doing, um, what are their cardiovascular risks and things like that. Um, like we mentioned, you're going to hear a lot of different things. A lot of times if I ask students like what's the best measure of kidney function, a lot of students will say BUN. And that is actually not specific to, to just kidney problems. Dehydration can cause you to have an elevated BUN. So the best measure is the GFR or glomerular filtration rate. Um, also, you know, creatinine, I mean, it's one of my favorites is one I like to look at a lot because um, we don't do GFRs on every patient, um, but the, both those, the B1 and creatinine alone are poor indicators and they can take a while to rise. You know, I can have a patient who has a really, really high creatinine, but they could be making a lot of urine. Sometimes it just depends on, um, you know, we really, we want to see accurately right now in this moment, how well it's filtering. So that best measure is going to be that glomerular filtration rate. Um, so there's a bunch of formulas that are used to calculate this. They take into consideration age, weight, and ethnicity. Um, and usually when you get a chemistry, like there's an estimated um, GFR that is calculated for you. And that's how we look at that. So you can look at that kind of on a daily basis on your chemistry and kind of see how your patient's doing, but that is gonna be the best measure for these patients. So this is just a little introduction to chronic kidney disease. And there's probably a lot more changes that you didn't even realize could happen for a patient that has chronic kidney disease. Um, but that's why these patients, they're very complicated. They have a lot of issues head to toe. So kind of starting to understand those issues is key so that we can take uh, best care of them possible um, and make sure that we prevent complications. Hope this was helpful. See you next time.